Um, <clears throat> I was... I was going for a walk last night, quick one around my block, and uh, taking a phone call that I received a text from a buddy that I met last January at a conference in Atlanta, and uh, he hit me up because he's coming to Pasadena. Do you live close to Pasadena? I was like, well, I was just there today, actually. So yeah, you live close enough. And um, just the reminders of, I, you know, my, our community, we, you guys know how much I love that type of language, being right where you're supposed to be. And I'm so relational, Dave. I run into people that I've known since high school. I run into them in you know, New York, and you guys hear me exhaust you with those types of ironic stories. And so I'm talking. Uh, I, I was about to do some more prep for today, last night, and then I got this text from my buddy, and I felt like I should take this call. And so I took the call, I was going for a walk, and this is all to just piggyback and celebrate what you just shared. I was going for a walk, and as I finished the call, I finished my walk and became more aware of my surroundings, uh, because when I was on the phone, I wasn't really paying attention very much as I walked the neighborhood. And right as I hung up the phone, um, a, a dog, a husky, walked right in front of me, loose. Right, like, and it was a little bit like, ooh, that's that's a big one right there, <laughs> you know. And I watched it sniff around our house and sniff around the neighbor's house, and our neighbors, praise God for the relationship we're building with them. One of our neighbors happened to be over at the house, and they have a husky. Say, hey, is this your husky? No, it's not ours. Okay, so then we put him on a leash. Was able to get uh, the dog, you know, to come come to me and um, care for this dog. And there was, uh, gave him a treat, put the leash on him, and, you know, had the little dog tag. Dog's name was Stormy, called the number on there. They got back to us. They lived like, you know, a couple blocks away. So me and Quincy, we walked the dog home. And the irony was it wasn't even the owner that was watching the dog. It was like a day. They were watching the dog for a day. So it was like, like they found the right person because, you know, this is L.A. People will snatch up a husky and then breed that thing or whatever or sell just sell the dog for some profit. You know, like there's whack people out there. So it was just awesome to be um, where I'm supposed to be and live, work and play. And we walked the dog home. And those people were so grateful. And then on my way home. The young neighbors close by are out there, and these are young 20-year-old kids making tons of money um, and, and just living life. And I was able to have a really substantial conversation. I'd, I shared the gospel with them, and they got baptized. Just kidding. No, they didn't. <laughs> but I did secure their names, right? That's an important thing in evangelism. Do you know, like, do you know your neighbor's names? And I have that now written down, catalog. Okay, I know their names. Got it. Boom. I did not share Jesus with them. I did not share the gospel. There was not a sermon or invitation. There was not an altar call on my street. But, but we created trusted relationship and, and mutual respect for each other. And I'm certain that we're going to be able to leverage that for the sake of the gospel. I know that. I was able to talk to these young guys about how I have a marriage that I would love, and it's the marriage that God gave me, and I didn't throw that in their face, but they know that, like, no, I'm a married man, and I love being married. And I asked them, like, who, who, who is uh, um, giving you a picture of marriage around you that makes you excited? And they're both like, oh, man, nobody, right? So here we have this rapport and credibility, and so... Um, I'm just, like I said, just piggybacking off what you said, um, Dave, to really honor being where God has divinely positioned us. Isn't that so cool? That every moment is sacred. And um, so, yeah, God, I just want to celebrate and say thank you for this space. Thank you for this neighborhood. Thank you for trusting us to be Christ-loving, following members of this community for your sake. 
and for the sake of others, for your glory and for, for the cause of reaching out to those who don't know you. May we know you in such a way that it draws other people to you. May, may we know you in such a way that we are excited about lifting you up, not just on Sundays, but every day. And may you draw people to yourself through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, <clears throat> I'm discerning like where we're going to go today, and I think we're going to do about like half of what I had planned for today, which means we'll still probably be here till 1130. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, well, if that's what the Lord wants. Um, <laughs> I saw a meme this week that said, if Paul were alive today, we'd be getting a letter. Right? Isn't that what it said, Dave Stanley? I sent it to you guys, right? It said something along those lines. Yeah. Paul was alive today, man. Hey, church be getting a letter. We would. You know, and so we're going through the New Testament, and we are now going through the epistles or the letters. That's what the word epistle means. We're going through these letters from the Apostle Paul that was a pastor, theologian, and church planter. And he traveled as a, and a missionary. He traveled as a missionary. Um, like, he did the whole deal. Like, like we, we got missionaries and pastors and, you know, evangelists. Like, you know, he was, like, going into a community, gaining respect and rapport, worshiping in their synagogues, explaining the scriptures, telling them who Jesus was, is, and um, establishing a community of believers and then commissioning them as disciples to make more disciples. Pretty awesome. And so then once these church were, churches were formed, they weren't perfect. They were very imperfect. And so then he would have to, you know, you know check in with these churches, kind of like Dave's checking in with us, right? Like, check in. How are you guys doing? Do you guys need anything? What's happening? Where's, where, what are the issues? What do we need to resolve? And then he would... He would write letters to them, and those are the letters that we're reading about, okay? We started, uh, we went through 1 Corinthians last week. We are now in 2 Corinthians, and one of my challenges to us last week was um, to now read these letters together, like if in your own personal time, like sometimes reading the Bible can feel very daunting, and uh, you just how do you eat an elephant, right? One bite at a time. I've never tried elephant personally, but so I've been told. Wow. Do you know how, squirrel moment, do you know how an elephant eats a whole tree? One bite at a time as well. At the Santa Barbara Zoo, I've actually watched an elephant eat an entire palm tree. I'm not joking, right? So if an elephant can eat a whole palm tree, Surely we can chip away at uh, feasting on the bread of life, the word of God, one bite at a time. So I'm inviting us, rabbit trail right back, um, I'm inviting us to be reading our Bibles together. And so last week was 1 Corinthians, this week is 2 Corinthians, and I believe that we're going to, um, as, as excited as I am about Galatians coming up, I believe that we're going to dive further into 2 Corinthians next week. Um, for the sake of time and wanting to honor communion, I just kind of want to today, and Dave, you being here, and that just being such a great word, I, I don't want to take away from that. Um, so I want to I give us a little bit of a recap of 1 Corinthians and an intro to 2 Corinthians, okay? To give you the context, because it's so important. Sometimes we want to read the Bible so that we did the good thing and did the good deed. And it's like, no, I, I want us entering into reading of the Bible as, as learners, which is interesting because what's the, what's the word disciple mean? A disciple is a learner. So we should be learners, not do-gooders, but constant learners until we enter into glory, like we should never stop learning. And so I want us to enter into the reading of the scriptures like it's our first time. 
and we're just entering in it to learn. And then on a deeper level, be transformed by it. I do not think it's a good idea to read, just open your Bible and read without getting any context. Like that's really important. And a couple ways that I get context uh, is if you have a study Bible, like uh, Anthony, I see you got a thick one. That's probably a study Bible. Got that big boy. At the beginning of every book, because the Bible's 66 books compiled into one, and um, at the beginning of every small book of the Bible, there should be an introduction. So that's one way that I get context. Like, read that introduction. Take the time to learn the context um, where of, of that specific book. So we're going to read 2 Corinthians this week. Read the context first. Um, Another way to get context with all the different tools that are out there, um, you guys ever heard of YouTube? Anybody use YouTube? Probably use YouTube for a bunch of stupid stuff like I do. Um, but, but YouTube can be used in really edifying ways too. And just a really cool, simple uh, Bible context tool that I love to use that I don't know how we've gone through like the whole Bible and I don't think I've really told you guys about this, maybe because I was like keeping that as my secret. But are you guys familiar with the Bible Project videos? You guys familiar with those? Okay, so you're yeah, all right. Um, but if you're not, you can just type into YouTube Bible Project and then the name of whatever book in the Bible that that you are gonna read. And it's a great, like usually six, seven, eight minute um, introduction to whatever book we're reading. So I want to challenge you guys to do some introduction work on Second Corinthians, and then this week, if you just read two chapters a day, you're gonna be there by next Sunday, and you'll have read through a whole book of the Bible, 2 Corinthians. And if you're really a geek, then um, I challenge you to spend like an hour or two and just read the whole thing. Because if these are Paul's letters to a church, they likely sat down and first go, I read through that whole thing. They probably didn't like have you know, the prayer meeting and say, all right, we're going to read chapters one and two because they didn't even have chapters and verses then. That's something we added later so we could navigate this big book. So they probably sat down and read the whole thing, okay? And so this specific, um, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, these specific letters were written to a church that Paul had planted and started in Corinth. And we talked last week about Corinth, um, and it was a it was a bustling, busy busy town, and I try to describe where it was, and if you have your Bibles, like I like to passive-aggressively shame you into making sure you bring every Sunday, um, then in the back, has anyone ever noticed that there's maps in the back of your Bible? Well, those are there for a purpose, and so the very last page in my Bible, this last map, has, is a map of Paul's missionary journeys, and so if you go to your Bible, which I know you brought, because um, I hear pages turning, and I won't look up to see who's not looking down at their Bible that they didn't bring, um, you'll see where Corinth is, and that's the city we're talking about. Like These are real places in real time um, that God had a real message for. Now, Paul doesn't have to write us letters um, now, because um, there's nothing new under the sun. The letters have been written. And so the truth is, Paul did write us letters. Yeah. There was a whole, a whole gang of them. And so um, Paul wrote to this town in Corinth. Um, if, if, you're, if your armpits are sweating because you can't find Corinth, just take some time to look at that later. I just wanted you to know where the maps are, okay? <laughs> so you can locate it for yourself at another time. But um, this town, as we talked about last week, um, w was, there was a lot of business. There was a lot of pleasure. Uh, there was a lot of both. It was a lot of Vegas, L.A., Amsterdam psh, combined, a lot of commerce there. And one of the things that we mentioned was that they worshipped a lot of different gods in this eclectic city. And one of those gods was the god, goddess of Aphrodite, who was said to be the goddess of love. And Paul is writing to a messed up church, just like we are messed up 
and we not just like talking about us like ooh passive aggressively saying guys we're messed up which is true but like the church like all of the church like the church in San Fernando Valley like like you know we sometimes we have things to say about the way the one down the street is doing it well that's a part of us that's a part of our church if Paul was to write a letter I don't think he would be like all right Christ community this is what you're doing good this is what you're doing bad I think it's it's a good idea for us to objectively entertain that and prayerfully think those thoughts, but I think he would probably write to the collection of San Fernando Valley, maybe even just West Valley, right, if he was to write to us today. And he would, he would see things like division, and he would see things like a misunderstanding of what love really is. And so he wrote to Corinth, and he was like, guys, you think you know what love is, and you worship this goddess of Aphrodite, and there's all sorts of prostitution and, um, and, and impurities and lack of sexual integrity going on, and, and Satan has perverted the idea of what love is and what marriage is. And he writes to a divided church to, remi- to, to shepherd them and pastor them and to remind them to stay in unity because we're all one body. And then he reminds them, of what love is and what that should look like in the confines of healthy relationship and community. Does that sound like a letter that doesn't need to be rewritten but would be relevant to us today? Big time. Big time. And so I'm really grateful for that reminder that God has called me to be someone who's a lover of people in community. <clears throat> so Paul writes that letter, does some more travels. He actually, I believe, writes another. I think he wrote a, a total of four letters. Um, and he moves on to other parts of the world, as you'll see on your map when you look through his track. Um, and he gets word that, um, that, that Corinth, his church in Corinth, um, is not honoring his shepherd's intentions of the first letter. Uh, he wrote another letter that was I wish we had, um, and then and then we do have this what we call Second Corinthians letter. This one that you're going to read this week has a different tone to it. This is probably like the most intimate letter we have of Paul to one of his churches. It's got this this blend of like Paul the apologist, where he's like, "All right, I got some explaining to do, and I'll tell you why in a second. But then you still see the shepherd heart. But you get to see deeper, intimately, into his broken shepherd's heart for this church. And I think it's this context that really makes it come alive. Rather than it just seem like like you're doing your Christian duty of like reading the Bible and being a good boy. Like, it's the context that really goes from like black and white to color. And... uh, what happens is when he leaves, <clears throat> uh, a festering group of false leaders and, and um, influencers, would be a good word, in the community continues to grow and um, infect the, the church in Corinth. And it looks a little bit like this. Can you imagine pouring all of your heart, life, soul, relational equity, all of, your, all of your knowing, all of your knowledge, all of your life experience into one thing. Like, imagine somebody coming into your job that you've worked at for years and coming in and calling out every one of your dysfunctions, every one of your vulnerabilities, every one of your insecurities, just coming through with critique after critique after critique of all of your weaknesses. How would you respond? How would you feel about that? Me? If somebody was to come in and just flat-out critique, now, come on, I invite accountability. Come on. 
I desire at daily, oh, I want to know, Lord, how can I grow in my weaknesses? How, but how can I strive, thrive in my strengths? But Lord, help me to be aware of my limitations. But if somebody was to come in with ill, prideful intent and come to our church, whew, man, and just pick out all the things that I have, I'm insecure about and I have weaknesses and, and, and I'm vulnerable and I don't want, oh, I don't want to. Like, truth be told, like, I, I, um, my response probably wouldn't. I'd probably poop my pants and then I, I would get defensive. Right? I would. There, would. there would definitely be some of that in me. And so here's Paul who has served, cared for. He hasn't taken a dime from these folks. And he has offered himself. He's done this for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of the people that God has called him to care for. He has poured himself out and shepherded them and given them all that he has. And then when he left, some, some people came through and they said, yo, that's your leader? That dude is poor. Um, he, he, he doesn't have a place to live. He's not eloquent. Have you looked at his resume? Did you see the school he went to? Like, they're just calling him out on all of his weaknesses and insecurities and just coming with unrighteous critique of him. And if you want to know how Paul responds... I invite you to read 2 Corinthians throughout this week. And we'll talk about it some more next week. <clears throat> You're going to find that um, he's actually got quite an extensive resume. But he's got this tension in his heart. He's like, oh, I don't, I shouldn't even be talking like this. I, shouldn't, I don't even desire to go into the flesh. I'm sure there's a part of it that was like, oh, you, you want to know who I am? Let me tell you about who I am. And, and so the Spirit like allows him, and, and he, he sensitizes it with, to say, like, I shouldn't even be talking like this, but since this is what you guys want to see, I'm going to give you a little bit. I'm going to appease your need to be reminded of the credentials that I have in the Lord and the way that I've poured myself out for you. That's what he does. But at the end of the day, he really just exalts the power of Jesus, his sufficient grace, and his deep love for these people. Like that's his, that's what he calls his letter of recommendation. He's like, my deep love for you guys and you guys, the, the, shep the people, the sheep that I've cared for, like you guys are my letters of recommendation. Um, Anything else I want to say to give you guys more context for 2 Corinthians? I think that's good. I think that's it. Does that get you excited to read 2 Corinthians a little bit? It's really dope. It's really dope. But do some of your own work in, in the introduction, um, too, and, and fill, in, if, fill in any of the gaps that I left off there. Um, what I want to do now is I just want to, I want to continue to celebrate Jesus, but I want us to commune with Jesus. Um, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I, I really sensed and felt like this morning, and this is what I pray that this space is for us and even for people online, which is so cool because I know people are there, like my sister texted me this week. And um, <clears throat> um, I really pray that these spaces and opportunities for worship are, are an opportunity to be present with God, not to replace your own personal time with God, um, but to be a, a corporate addition to you being present with God. And so, Raul, would you come back up, man? Um, play some more uh, just piano for us. Allow us to sit in the presence of God. Um, there is communion in the back. It's first Sunday, and we, we love to make sure that we... Um, we allow that opportunity. So in your timing, um, as you are in, enjoying 
this moment with the Lord, would you just go, um, if, if you're a believer and you you know, like to uh, worship the Lord in that way, would you go get bread and juice and you can bring it back to your seat and take it, take it in your timing? Uh, reflecting on, like we were praying earlier, the realities that not only did Jesus come as we celebrate in Christmas, um, as an infant, right? But it's the reality that he did come and he did, there was, there's an actual human that suffered, died. Like that's a reality on our behalf. Um, so take the bread, take the juice in celebration of the realities of our faith as a tangible expression of the theological truths that we read about and that we sing about and rest in those realities this morning. That's my invitation to you as we take communion.